There are a lot of things we miss that we walk right by that if we could just make a point to see them would add tremendous value to our lives. There's a saying that your problem is your gift. The situations that knock us down or push us back are the same situations that had the potential to move us forward had we only looked at them a little differently. Sure, no one's positive all the time, but it's not impossible to see the value in every situation, to take what the world throws at you and turn it into your advantage, into positive energy. Life will always be what you make it, and what you make it is entirely up to you. Life's greatest accomplishments weren't always on some pedestal, always admired. They were built on the back of hardship and difficulty. They were carved out of doubt and transformed from negativity. They were turned from a loss to a gain, from the unexpected into an asset. Look, the right perspective has the ability to transform all things. When you are the one who defines your own reality, can you really afford to live your life with your eyes closed? Hi, and welcome to worship. My name is John Woods, and I'm the pastor here at Tabernacle United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you've joined us today. If you're a guest to Tabernacle, we send a special welcome to you. We're so glad that you have joined us. If you're a regular part of our church family, it's good to have you along with us today as well. We turn our hearts to our Savior, Jesus Christ. We prepare our hearts for our worship together, and we begin our worship by singing our first song, Glorious Day. As you're able, I invite you to join us as we lift up our voices in praise to Jesus.
We come now to an opportunity for us to lay before our Heavenly Father the prayers of our hearts. I want to remind you once again that we have a God who understands us. He knows our needs, and he encourages us, bids us to come before him, to lay our hearts before his throne of mercy, and to bring before him the petitions of his people. So I want to invite you, where you are at, to bow your heads, to close your eyes, and to join us as we pray together. So let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to worship you. We find ourselves still in unthinkable times. This shift that we have found ourselves in has shown our frailty. It's shown our weakness. It's revealed that we live in darkness, that we dwell in a land of deep darkness. Nonetheless, Lord, we remember that the light shines in the darkness and that the darkness cannot overcome it. We've been separated and isolated from one another. And we know that in this world there will continue to be trouble. Nonetheless, we take heart because we know that Jesus has overcome this world. We're conflicted and we're confused. We have grown weary in these days. And yet still... We know that those who trust in the Lord will find new strength, that we will mount up on wings as eagles, that we will walk and not grow faint. God, it feels like we've been knocked down, but we know that we are not out. We've been sidelined, but still we're in the game. And every day we strive to care for our families. We hold on to love. We aim for kindness. And still the hard times continue to come. Our lives continue to be difficult and stressful. Still we know that we're more than conquerors through him who loves us. And so we walk through adversity. And it doesn't change the truth that we are still sons and daughters of the Most High. We know to whom we belong. We know where our hope lies because we know that our Savior is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is and the one who is yet to come. And even though times can be bleak and grim, even though there is still a lot of fear, Lord, we remain strong and courageous and victorious because we know that your grace is sufficient for our every need. We understand that in our weakness, you are made strong. And we remember that we have been chosen by you, redeemed by you, known by you, blessed, and sealed for a future that nothing can take away, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor things present nor things to come, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from your great love in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, this day we come before you asking that you would be at work in us and through us, that you would heal this world, that you would heal broken hearts, and that you would restore all to your kingdom. We pray this as always in the name of the one who did come for us, your son, Jesus Christ, who healed those who were ill, comforted those who were mourning, and offered hope and life and light to all. When he was asked, he gave us a prayer that we now join in praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it's in response to all of the blessings and goodness that God has showered to us that I invite you to return a portion of that goodness back to his kingdom and back to the ministry of his work in this world. We especially appreciate the ways in which you support Tabernacle Church for our ministry and our mission, you will find that one of the best ways to support us in these times is through the Easy Tithe app. You'll find a description located either above or below this video. And I encourage you, as you have been blessed, to return a portion of those blessings, God's tithes, 
and our offerings to our Heavenly Father. Hi everyone, it's Pastor John. I want to spend a little time with some of God's youngest children today. Hey, so if you will, I just want to invite you to come just maybe a little closer to the TV for us to talk just for a minute or two. I have two things that I want to show you today. The first is this thing on a wall. It's called a thermostat. And then I have something right here. This is called a thermometer. Maybe you've heard of thermometers before. They take your temperature. This one, you don't even have to stick it in your mouth. You can just do like that. And it tells me what my temperature is. A therm thermometer tells what your temperature is. A thermostat does something a little bit different. It deals with temperature as well, but it doesn't tell what the temperature is. It changes what the temperature is. And it's kind of made me think these days, there are some people that are a lot like a thermometer. All they do is kind of tell you what things are like right now. So if it's hot, they will be hot. If it's cold, they'll be cold. If they're angry, if other people are angry, they'll be angry. If other people are yelling, they will yell too. They just are like everybody else. But do you know that God calls us not to be that way? Jesus says that rather than being a thermometer, that we should be like this thermostat. Because a thermostat changes how things are. It changes the environment. So whether it's hot, you can turn this so that it cools down. If it's too cold, you can change this so that it gets warm. I think Jesus calls us to do the same thing. To be the ones who influence what our environment is like. So we can be kind, or we can be full of joy, or we can be very patient or loving. No matter what the environment is around us, we can be a person who influences what the environment is like by our own words and actions. 
we're able to do that because Jesus is in our hearts. In fact, there's a passage in the Bible that tells us something like that. The Apostle Paul is writing to some of his friends in Rome. And here's what he says. He says, do not be conformed to this world. Don't, don't be like the world is. That's like a thermometer. It just tells you what the temperature of the world is. Paul says, don't be like the world is. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. That means that we can be thermostats. We can be people who change the temperature of the lives of people around us by showing love, by being generous, by being kind, and being full of joy and goodness and patience. My hope is that this week you will find a way to change the temperature of your attitude, change the temperature of the attitudes of people around you, by reminding them of who we are in Jesus Christ. And you know, one of the things that I've learned is I can't do that by myself. I have to ask Jesus to help me. So I thought maybe you would join me as we pray together today. So would you bow your heads and let's close your eyes and let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the chance to worship you. Thank you for the family that we have. Please help us to be people who are not changed by the situations around us, but people who are able to change the situation with your love and with your joy, with your peace. That's what you want us to do, to not be thermometers, but to be thermostats, people who change this world in your name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being with us. I'm so glad that you're worshiping today with us. God bless you. Choose. You know, the older I get, the more aware I am that life is simply an accumulation of all of the choices that we make. From the minute that we wake up in the morning until the moment that we stop for the day and we tuck ourselves into bed, we make a series of choices that define our day. Some choices, of course, are easy. Other choices are complex. Some were the right choices in our lives. Some other choices we make are not good at all. Sometimes uh, I'm sure about the choices that I'm making. Other times I'm not sure that it's the right choice at all. Some choices I would make again and again and again, and then other times I can't believe I made that choice the very first time. And regardless of what they are, our choices matter. Because we really are nothing more than the sum total of all the choices that we make over the years of our life. I am who I am. I am where I am. I am doing what I do as a result of thousands of decisions and choices that I make over a long period of time. And Frank once said, our lives are fashioned by our choices. First, we make our choices, and then our choices make us. And because our choices matter, the Bible has a lot to say about the choices that you and I make. Near the very end of his life, Moses challenged Israel with these words, and I invite you to listen as I read from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30. Moses is talking, and he says, Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and committing yourself fully to Him. Here's the truth. You and I, we have been created by God and allowed by God to have the freedom to make choices about what our lives will look like. 
The choices we make can either mean life or they can mean death. It can bring joy or it can bring sorrow. Our decisions can pick people up or they can knock them down. We can bring pleasure or cause pain. We can either be peacemakers or heartbreakers. And we have a choice. We can build up or we can tear down. And the happiest people I know are those who realize that they have that choice and they have chosen to build up. I think that's part of what Jesus meant when he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. The Scottish author William Barclay points out that there are people who are always the storm center of trouble and bitterness and strife. Wherever they are, they're either involved in quarrels themselves or they cause quarrels between other people. They are troublemakers. And to be honest with you, there are people like that in every society. But on the other hand, thank goodness, there are people in whose presence bitterness just can't live. People who bridge the gulf, who heal the breaches, who sweeten the lives of those who are around them. In either case, the choice is ours. So today, I want to remind you of two of the choices that you can make this week. First, we can choose to either encourage or we can choose to discourage. There is a strange sentence in one of the Psalms. In Psalm 39, the king of Israel, King David, says, I will bridle my mouth. He talks like he's a horse. Those are the words of a man who's sorely tempted to speak things that maybe he shouldn't, to spread gloom and despair and disappointment. And yet he held himself in check. He bit his own tongue, knowing that there is enough anger and enough bile and enough pessimism already in this world. So he held his tongue. Hey, that's really good advice because the reality is this world has enough cynics and enough pot stirrers. Instead, our world is longing for people who give words of assurance and encouragement. You know, this week more than ever, I have been reminded that no one wants to be put down. If you were with us last week, you might remember that I said that sometimes our own words tell more about ourselves than what we might imagine. A number of years ago at annual conference, Bishop Lindsay Davis told about a time when he and his family were appointed to another church in the United Methodist Church. No sooner had the moving vans pulled out of the driveway than one of the ladies of his new church came up into the parsonage. Reverend Davis, she said, my name is Verna Lou. Now, I know it's your first day here at our church and you don't know everybody, so I brought a church picture directory for you. Uh, By the way, I've already gone ahead and I've circled the pictures of the members who are gonna give you trouble while you're at this church. So she proceeded to go through that entire directory, name by name, stopping at every circled picture and carefully pointing out every person's peccadilloes and perceived shortcomings. She spent over an hour detailing why each of those people would be on her list and how they were going to be a problem for this new minister. Then she handed him the directory and she left. Bishop Davis confessed, he said, as soon as she drove out of the driveway, I searched around for a pen and I found her picture in the directory and I circled it in big circles. (laughs) You know, sometimes our own actions betray who we are. Here's the truth. Our world is crying to be lifted up these days. What have you been choosing lately? Because the choice is yours. You can either encourage or you can discourage. And it's so much better, so much more godly for us to encourage others. And isn't it sad that so many people have gotten it all mixed up? They think that they are divinely 
ordained to point out all of the bad things and to show us all of the problems and to underscore all of the negatives in this world. Why do we feel that we have to spread so much gloom? It's so much more fun to lift people up than it is to tear them down. Laura Huxley puts it like this. She said, at one point or another, the most fortunate among us will make three startling discoveries. Discovery number one, each one of us has, in varying degrees, the power to make others feel better or to make them feel worse. Discovery number two, making others feel better is much more rewarding than making them feel worse. And finally, discovery number three, making others feel better frequently, generally makes us feel better also. Hey, one of the great people of the early church was a man by the name of Barnabas. His name means son of encouragement. Barnabas was a significant leader in the early church because he lived out his name. He was an encourager. And we in the church ought to be modern-day Barnabas ourselves, sons and daughters of encouragement for whoever is around us. People who listen, people who care, people who affirm others. We should be people who support one another, who lift each other up and hold up one another and build each other up. But of course, the choice is yours. You can encourage or you can discourage. The second choice that I lay before us this day is that we can soothe or we can seethe. There is nothing more destructive to our spirits than seething our hearts full of resentment. It's a spiritual cancer, to be honest with you. It can ruin our lives. It can ruin our spirits. In fact, it can literally make us sick. The Swiss doctor and counselor, Paul Tournier, talks about a woman who is being treated for anemia. Doctors had been working with her for months and months without very much success. They have tried all kinds of medicines, all kinds of vitamins and diet and exercise, all to no avail. As a last result, it was decided to put her into the hospital. As she was being checked in, the hospital ran a rather routine check of her blood work. To their surprise, they discovered that it was all fine. She was well. She had been healed. There was no sign of that anemia. Miraculously, she had been healed. Tournier was intrigued, so her doctor asked, has anything out of the ordinary happened since our last visit? Oh, yes, she said. I, I was so scared of what might happen and what you might find when I came into the hospital, I started thinking about my life and, and how people maybe would remember me. And thinking about it, I was suddenly aware and able to forgive someone against whom I had been bearing a nasty grudge. And doctor, would you believe all at once I felt as if I could at last say yes to life. Her resentments had been making her ill. And when she stopped that seething, and she decided that she would soothe the relationship with others, the impact was so great, it was so powerful, that it changed the physical state of her body. In the New Testament, in Hebrews 12, the scripture exhorts us to pursue peace with all people, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, cause any trouble. You see, it's better to laugh than it is to get all torqued and twisted about situations. A number of years ago, James Moore presided over a wedding that, that turned into something of a disaster because the bride did not understand. She lost perspective. Seems that she was determined 
that she was going to have absolutely the most perfect wedding. She included everything that she had ever heard of in her wedding. There were bridesmaids, there were groomsmen, there were acolytes, there were altar boys and unity candles, flower girls and ring bearers, the whole works. And everything was going beautifully until the time came for the husband and wife to kiss. As a surprise to everyone, the bride had asked her brother to turn on the church sound system and to play, of all things, a music CD, 2001, A Space Odyssey. The music came on with such a blast that the maid of honor jumped she knocked over one of the candles, and as the best man tried to catch the, the falling candle, he stepped onto the bride's dress, which ripped. She dropped her flowers, and her veil fell off her head. She tripped as she turned to go out the church. And at that, the flower girl started to cry. And by the time that bride and groom reached the back of the church, she was furious. She had decided, by the way, that it was all the groom's fault. And he couldn't figure out what it was that he had done wrong. The minister had to take them into a private room to try to calm them down before they could even head off to the reception. The minister said, look, you're married. That's all that matters. You love each other and you want to share your life together and you are just as married as any couple that's ever taken those sacred vows. That's what this is all about. All of the candles and all of the pageantry, that, that's just icing on the cake. There are no perfect weddings and the things that went wrong are just things that you will one day laugh about in the years to come. You love each other, he reminded them. And you're married, and that's what's important. Sometimes we have to be reminded of what really is important so we don't get too far out of focus and get too upset over things that we shouldn't. I know of another couple who is getting married. The, the minister asked the groom, will you take this woman to be your wedded wife, to live together in hol the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love her and comfort her? Will you honor and keep her in sickness and in health and forsaking all others? Keep yourself only to her as long as you both shall live. Well, the groom was so nervous standing there in front of all of his friends and all of his family uh, that he wasn't listening to what the minister was really saying. All of a sudden, he realized that the minister was talking to him, and he turned and he said, w would you repeat the question? They have it on video, and do you know that every now and then, even to this very day, when things get a little tense, when they get a little tired and stressed, they will pull that out and watch it, and they'll laugh together. So what do you think? The, the choice is yours. We can either encourage or we can discourage. We can soothe or we can seethe. Friends, all it takes is pausing to take a deeper look at our life and at our surroundings and our situation and the gift of love and of grace that God has given to all of us and to remember our Savior's call to share that same love to everyone else. As we heard last week, the call is for us to love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength and to love others the way that we love ourselves. When Ira Gallat, who's a missionary in East Africa, returned home from overseas, he related a very interesting phenomenon. He noticed that repeatedly uh, uh, groups would walk right past the government hospitals and they would travel many, many extra miles to reach medical treatment that was being given at the missionary complex. He finally asked one of the group of people why they walked the extra distance uh, when they had the same treatment that was available right there at the government clinics. The reply was, the medicines might be the same, but the hands are different. 
hey, that is the virtue of love incarnate. That's the kind of love and life that makes a difference to everyone around us, to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family, to this world. It's what brings healing and hope. It's what happens when we choose life over death, when we choose blessing over curses, when we choose Jesus over whatever else this world tries to convince us is more important. My prayer is that that's a choice that you will make this week, that you will be intentional in choosing to encourage others, that you will be intentional in seeking to soothe troubled waters through the gift and the grace that Jesus Christ has given you. I want to invite you to bow your heads and let's pray for that together. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would remind us of the grace that you have filled us with, a grace that has come through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would be at work in us so that all those that we speak to, all of those that we surround ourselves with, all of those that we think about might know of our love and support that we might offer words of encouragement and that when nerves become frayed, we might offer the calming balm and soothing words that you fill our hearts with. We pray this as always in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey friends, where you are, I want to invite you to join with us as we close our service together, singing our closing hymn, I Surrender All. What a great song for us to offer ourselves to the Lord and say, Jesus, would you take charge? Would you take control of my mind, of my mouth, of my spirit, of my life? Friends, how glad it has been for us to be able to be together in this time of worship. I'm so thankful for your presence and for your ability to join us this day. As you go forth from this place, I invite you to carry the light of Jesus Christ, to choose him and his way, his path, his love above all else. Go forth now in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit.
May God continue to bless you this week.